This is the story of one of, if not the, most consequential Supreme Court opinions in history. It's up there with Roe v. Wade and Brown v. Board of Education for its name recognition. But few people today know much about it, or that it was decided over the protest of two justices. It's a ruling that was a catalyst for Abraham Lincoln's famous House Divided speech, which catapulted him onto the national stage and contributed to his election as president in 1860. It's a ruling that led a sitting Supreme Court justice to resign in protest. It's a ruling that plunged our nation into its darkest hour, a civil war that nearly tore us apart. I'm Elizabeth Slattery. And I'm Anastasia Bowden. This week on DIST, we're looking at Dred Scott versus Sanford. The court's decision is indefensible. I respectfully dissent. Because the majority in this case has not done what a court of law must do, I respectfully dissent. For these reasons and others elaborated in my opinion, I respectfully dissent. We respectfully dissent. I respectfully dissent. I respectfully dissent. I dissent. Dred Scott v. Sanford ranks among only a handful of Supreme Court cases that most Americans are vaguely familiar with. Deep in the recesses of your mind, you may recall learning about it in American history back in high school. Something to do with slavery— Lincoln railed against it, led to the Civil War. It may have even crossed your mind a few years ago when a statue of Roger Taney, the author of that ruling, was removed from outside the Maryland State House in Annapolis. But what is the legacy of that ruling? And does it affect how we think about our founding fathers, our Constitution, and our country today? The Dred Scott case brought about a long simmering reckoning, the collision of ideals our nation was founded on and the institution of slavery. So let's start with those ideals as expressed by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What did this language mean in the founding era? I know just the guy to ask. I'm Jeffrey Rosen, the president of the National Constitution Center. So let's begin with the words of the Declaration. Uh, Jefferson said that he wasn't making them up out of thin air, but was channeling the thought of Aristotle and Cicero and John Locke and Sidney and other publicists of the time. So Jefferson was expressing an idea about natural rights theory uh, that begins in the state of nature. The idea is that all human beings are born in the state of nature with, with certain rights that come from God or nature and not from government. And we can't alienate or surrender those rights when we form governments, even if we want to. And the preamble of the Constitution begins. Now, we the people, of course, from the Constitution, um, uh, builds on that natural rights theory, but represents an innovation of sorts, um, in particular by the great framer James Wilson, um, who wrote the very earliest drafts of the Constitution. Wilson's notion was that we the people of the United States as a whole form governments when we leave the state of nature, and we the people as a whole have the sovereign power. Now, that was a radical idea because, of course, uh, in much of Europe at the time, the king or some autocrat had the sovereign power. In Britain, the idea was that the king in parliament had the sovereign power, and in practice, that meant that parliament embodied by the prime minister ruled. In America, Wilson's notion was not Congress, not uh, the president, not any branch of government, but the people themselves have the sovereign power. And from that, everything else flowed. But at the same time, a lot of people were left out of we the people. Here's more from Jeff. Jefferson did indeed exclude many people from those promises and guarantees. Um, African Americans were uh, notoriously excluded from the promises of we the people, uh, as were women, uh, as were other excluded groups and minorities. Um, But the language of the Declaration was not merely aspirational. It was declared as a universal truth applicable to all peoples in all times, in all places. And the framers themselves, including Jefferson, were acutely aware of the clash between positive laws, they called it, and natural law. And they were, uh, many of them, properly embarrassed and ashamed by this 
clash. And it is significant that advocates of liberation and abolition of slavery uh, from Prince Hall, who gave a petition to the Massachusetts legislature in 1777 to the great Frederick Douglass, to Henry Highland Garnett, all invoked the language of the Declaration to insist that African Americans be granted the equality which the laws of nature gave them, along with every other human being on earth. The tension between these ideals and the institution of slavery was apparent from the very beginning and led to compromises when it came time to draft the Constitution. Here's Jeff. There was profound tension at the time of the founding, as you say, and different founders had different degrees of prescience with regard to the extinction of slavery and hypocrisy with regard to their own practices regarding slavery. We know that the framers made compromises, and that led to some of the infamous um, parts of the Constitution, including the Three-Fifths Clause and the Fugitive Slave Clause. But it's extremely significant that the Constitution, as the dissenting opinions in Dred Scott recognized, went out of its way not to recognize the possibility that there could be property in men as Madison says. Thus, the timeless language of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution put our fledgling country on a collision course with the institution of slavery. While the founding generation was unable to achieve all that the Declaration promised, compromises were made in our Constitution, and our country was born with contradictions. But some would continue to push for a more perfect union. Let's get to the laws and the man that would bring about this reckoning. As new states entered the Union, politicians tried to keep the peace between slave states and free states. And when the Missouri Territory sought statehood, Congress struck a bargain. Here's the author of Dred Scott and the Problem of Constitutional Evil. My name is Mark A. Graber. The Missouri Compromise was passed in 1820. The deal was Missouri would come into a union, but all territories north of the 36th parallel line, which is the southern border of Missouri, would be slave-free. Slavery would be banned in those territories. This settled the matter, at least for a short time, but ultimately neither side was pleased for long. Northerners opposed extending slavery into new territory, and Southerners opposed Congress asserting the authority to pass laws dealing with slavery at all. Then came the Compromise of 1850 and the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, which effectively repealed the earlier ban on slavery north of the 3630 parallel by allowing the people of proposed states to determine by popular sovereignty whether to allow slavery. So those were the laws that brought about a reckoning. Now who was the man? Enter the intrepid Dred Scott, who first tried to buy his freedom, and when he was unsuccessful, spent 11 years fighting to secure freedom for himself, his wife, and his two daughters. Here's Mark again. Well, Dred Scott was originally owned by a man named John Emerson. Among other things, Emerson was stationed in Illinois, which is a free state, and Emerson was stationed in Minnesota, which was a free territory by the Missouri Compromise. At some point, Emerson just gives the whole thing up and returns to Missouri, where he promptly drops dead. And in fact, his widow, who is, or sorry, his sister, who is married to a man named Sanford, inherits Dred Scott. And what started him down the path to freedom? Dred Scott, while working apparently on the shipyards or the docks, learns that if he's been to a free territory in a free state, he may be free and sues. This spends about three years in Missouri courts, but at the end, Missouri says, no, if a slave voluntarily returns from a free state or a free territory, slavery reattaches. Whereupon, Dred Scott's lawyer files a suit in federal court on the ground that federal courts can follow common law. They don't have to follow Missouri law. 
and that spends five or six years being litigated at a very late stage in the pleadings, Sanford's lawyer raises a new argument, says, by the way, Dred Scott cannot sue in a federal court because he's not an American citizen, even if he's free. No free black can be an American citizen. So that's how the case comes up to the Supreme Court. So what were the issues once the case reached the Supreme Court? Here's Mark. One, did Scott gain freedom when he went to a free territory? Or was the ban on slavery in that free territory illegal? Second, what happened to Scott when he returned? To Missouri, did it matter? Could Missouri reattach? And three, could Scott bring this suit at all, given that he was a free black and perhaps not an American citizen? And the case ended up being argued twice. Why? Here's the author of Slavery in the Supreme Court. So my name is Earl Maltz. I'm a distinguished professor of law at uh, Rutgers University School of Law. Well, the reason it had to be argued twice had to do with a technical issue. So it was first argued in February 1856. And after the argument, the judges were deeply divided on the question of whether, in fact, the objection to the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court of the federal courts had been waived in the lower courts. And because they were deep, they were divided four to four and one justice was uncertain. And as a result, they had the case re-argued in order to allow the justice to come to a conclusion on that very technical issue. And that made a big difference because the first argument was in February 1856. And what happened between those two arguments? The second argument was not until December 1856. And in between, we had the presidential election of 1856, which were the first election in which the Republican Party participated as a party and based on an, an opposition to slavery in the territories. And they had a very strong showing, particularly in the North, even though they didn't win. So the political context had dramatically changed. James Buchanan was elected president. He'll come back into the story again later. For some time leading up to the Dred Scott case, there had been a pressure campaign to get the court to resolve the issue of slavery in the territories. Here's Mark. The court was being pressured to resolve all the issues about slavery in Western territory. Politicians were saying, let the court do it. And a number of the justices apparently thought if the court handed down a firm ruling, the nation would say, well, that's that and go on to other issues. Indeed, a number of people have said the Compromise of 1850 and the Kansas-Nebraska Act were not laws, but invitations to a lawsuit. So each provision, each law had a provision that said, if there is any legal controversy over the constitutionality of this law or anything else, it goes to the Supreme Court, even if Nothing else about the controversy um, allows it to go. So if, for example, if there were rules that the judges had to divide in the lower court, no, we don't care. It goes to the Supreme Court. They structured the laws of slavery after 1850 to see that any time there was a lawsuit, it could get to the Supreme Court. And the justices accepted the invitation. That brings us to March 6th, 1857, to the Day of Reckoning, so to speak. The court ruled against Dred Scott over the protest of two justices. But before we dig into the ruling, let's set the stage. This was the third decade of Roger Taney's tenure as Chief Justice. Remember him? Andrew Jackson's loyal hatchet man? As a refresher, Taney had been Attorney General, recess appointed Secretary of the Treasury, rejected for that post by the Senate, and then rejected by the Senate as a nominee for an associate justice spot on the Supreme Court. Taney ultimately took the center seat on the court after a series of judicial vacancies and a shift in the composition of the Senate. Then, after Taney's arrival at the Supreme Court, Congress added two more seats in 1837, bringing the total to nine. So, what did the court look like by the time Dred Scott's case arrived in 1856? Here's Mark. 
And the most important thing to know about the court is because of the Judiciary Act of 1837. Five justices hailed from slave states, even though slave states only had about a third of the population. Just as it played a central role when new states were admitted to the Union, slavery had seeped into the politics of selecting Supreme Court justices. Now let's take a closer look at the dissenters in Dred Scott versus Sanford. First up, Benjamin Curtis. Curtis was nominated to the court by Millard Fillmore in 1851. Here's Earl again. He was from a very prominent Massachusetts family. He went to Harvard Law School, practiced law, had a very distinguished career as a lawyer before coming to the Supreme Court. Uh, He was a conservative Whig. That is, even as late as the mid-1850s, when the, when the Republican Party formed, he, did, he was not known as being a member of the Republican Party, but still a Whig, even after the Whigs had mostly disintegrated. As a conservative Whig, he was personally opposed to slavery, but also had a probably even stronger belief in the need to keep the union together and to meet and to have sectional accommodations. And what was his reputation as a justice? I think smart, very strong on legal analysis, still moderate, but mostly focused on the distinctively legal parts of of cases and focused on that in a way that was neutral. I think that would probably be the best best definition. Uh, He was chosen by Millard Fillmore, who was was himself a conservative Whig, and was chosen for that purpose and at at the time was thought to be from the perspective of the of a very strong legal mind. And I don't think he was terribly controversial before Dred Scott, but of course, lots of people became controversial after Dred Scott or during Dred Scott. The other dissenter, John McLean, had previously served on the Ohio Supreme Court. He was appointed by Andrew Jackson. Yes, the same president who nominated Roger Taney. McLean never met a party he didn't like, a political party, that is. He cycled through the Jacksonian Democrats, the anti-Jackson Democrats, anti-Masons, Whigs, Free Soilers, and Republicans. And he angled for the presidential nomination of more than one party, including the Republican Party, in 1856, right as the justices were considering Dred Scott's case for the second time. McLean was steadfastly opposed to slavery and believed the Constitution was a pro-abolition document. In a case he heard while he was on the Ohio court, he wrote that slavery is, quote, an infringement upon the sacred rights of men, rights which he derives from his creator and which are inalienable. With that background in mind, let's dig into the ruling. Here's Jeff Rosen with a quick summary. There are three big arguments in the case, and Tawny makes them with great overconfidence, and um, the dissents take him to task. Uh, The first question is, did Dred Scott become free when his master, Sanford, took him to the free state of Illinois and also to Fort Snelling, which was a federal territory uh, in Wisconsin? And Tawney says no, that basically his status as a slave is determined by his domicile, and his domicile is Missouri, and Missouri law says that he didn't become free by his sojourns. If that's all Tawney said, Dred Scott would not be the most notorious decision of all time. It would have been unfortunate for Dred Scott, but it would not have had broader consequences. But of course, Tawney had a lot more to say. He says, uh, first, that... African Americans can never be citizens of the United States, including the incredibly notorious line about how white people at the time the Constitution was framed believed that black people had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. And he purports to root that in the original understanding of the Constitution, and he talks about all the incredibly racist laws that not only Southern states, but free states. And he goes out of his way to quote the laws of Massachusetts and Connecticut forbidding intermarriage and and whatnot to assert his very confident belief that free African Americans could never be considered uh, citizens of the United States and and, uh, nor, nor full citizens of the states where they resided. 
And the third argument that he makes, uh, which is very tendentious, is that the territories clauses of the Constitution, which authorizes Congress to make all laws needful for the federal territories, only apply to the Northwest Ordinance. And he puts a lot of stress on the fact that it's the territory, not territories. And he says that after Congress legislated with regard to the Northwest Ordinance, it can't legislate more broadly with regard to the status of uh, slavery in the territories. And that, in fact, to attempt to ban slavery in the territories deprives slaveholders of their rights of property protected by the Due Process Clause. So it's both an argument about the scope of congressional power under the Territories Clause and an argument about the constraints of, of the Due Process Clause, which is why Dred Scott is called a notorious example of substantive due process, of, of saying that the property clause of the Fifth Amendment has a, a substantive component that's offended by depriving slaveholders of their rights. So the, so the dissents kind of systematically demolish all of those arguments, but um, that's basically what Tommy argues. But it gets a little more complicated. Here's Mark. The actual holding is a bit controversial because it's very difficult to figure out what proposition actually got five votes. However, Justice Tony's opinion was not simply labeled Justice Tony's opinion, it was labeled the opinion of the court, so we can presume at least four other justices said this will do. The justices had returned to their practice of issuing seriatim opinions, where each justice wrote his own opinion. And Justice Curtis argued in his dissent that parts of Tawney's opinion weren't even binding because they were beyond the scope of what the court had been asked to decide. Tawney spent a lot of ink arguing that the founders never intended for blacks to be a part of we the people or the all men in all men are created equal. He wrote that this language, quote, would seem to embrace the whole human family, and if they were used in a similar instrument at this day would be so understood. But it is too clear for dispute that the enslaved African race were not intended to be included and formed no part of the people who framed and adopted this declaration. For if the language, as understood in that day, would embrace them, the conduct of the distinguished men who framed the Declaration of Independence would have been utterly and flagrantly inconsistent with the principles they asserted, and instead of the sympathy of mankind to which they so confidently appealed, they would have deserved and received universal rebuke and reprobation. Rebuke and reprobation, you say? Like how one contemporary response to the Declaration of Independence rhetorically asked, how is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes? Here's more from Tawney's opinion. Quote, Yet the men who framed this declaration were great men, high in literary achievements, high in their sense of honor, and incapable of asserting principles inconsistent with those on which they were acting. They perfectly understood the meaning of the language they used and how it would be understood by others, and they knew that it would not in any part of the civilized world be supposed to embrace the Negro race, which, by common consent, had been excluded from civilized governments and the family of nations and doomed to slavery. In other words, according to Tawney, the founding generation weren't hypocrites, they were simply white supremacists. In his dissent, Benjamin Curtis responded to this. Here's Jeff. My own opinion, says Justice Curtis, is that a calm comparison of these assertions of universal abstract truths and of their own individual opinions and acts would not leave those men under any reproach of inconsistency, that the great truths they asserted on that solemn occasion, they were ready and anxious to make effectual, were ever a necessary regard to circumstances, which no statesman can disregard without producing more evil than good would allow, and that it would not be just to them nor true in itself to allege that they intended to say that the creator of all men had endowed the white race ex exclusively with the great natural rights which the Declaration of Independence asserts. But this is not the place to vindicate their memory. Curtis is practical, and he wants to get to the concrete facts. As I conceive, we should deal here not with such disputes, if there can be a dispute concerning the subject, but with those substantial facts evinced by the written constitution of the states and by the notorious practice under them, and they show, in a manner which no argument can obscure, that in some of those original 13 states, three colored persons before and at the time of the formation of the constitution were citizens of those states. Can't say it better than Justice Curtis. So the gist of Curtis's argument is that five out of the original 13 colonies recognized rights of free African Americans. He says it's often been asserted that the Constitution was made exclusively by and for the white race. It's already been shown 
that in five of the 13 original states, colored persons then possessed the elective franchise and were among those by whom the Constitution was ordained and established. If so, it's not true in point of fact that the Constitution was made exclusively by the white race, as free colored persons were then citizens of at least five states. And so in every part sense, part of the people of the United States, they were among those for whom and whose posterity the Constitution was ordained and established. So that's devastating and totally persuasive as an original matter. But then Curtis goes on and says, in fact, there are also all of these state court decisions, including those in North Carolina, of all places, that recognize the rights of free African Americans at the time of the framing and the status of citizens at the time that the Constitution was framed was determined by their status under the Articles. And here are all these state constitutions um, under the Articles that also recognize rights of free African Americans. So Tawny's an embarrassingly bad originalist uh, when you read Curtis's dissent. So what did Justice Curtis say about the majority deciding whether the Missouri Compromise was constitutional? Here's Earl. They shouldn't do it. He says it's dictum. Is basically what he says. He says it's dictum and not binding, which is, again, on, on the technical legal issue, that's actually fairly complicated because it's not clear that there were five justices who, who were willing to express the opinion that free blacks could not become citizens. But Curtis's opinion is... We should have just decided this case on, if, if that's your jurisdictional point, if you just decide the case on jurisdictional point, why are we talking about the rest of this stuff? Jeff agrees, saying of Chief Justice Taney. It was his hunger to leap out and decide unnecessarily the constitutionality of the Missouri Compromise, which he didn't have to do, and he could have decided the case on narrower grounds that was ultimately his undoing, perhaps even more than his personal views on slavery. So on the merits, what did Justice Curtis have to say about the Missouri Compromise? Here's Jeff. Justice Curtis sums up the three major opinions about the status of slavery that were being contested in 1857. One is Congress can uh, ban slavery, but it can't allow it in the territories. The other is that it's up to the people of the territories and Congress can't allow or ban it. And the third is that uh, slaveholders' rights have to be completely protected and that depriving slaveholders of those rights, depriving them of property. He says there's, the Constitution doesn't clearly um, answer this. The first seems to be rested on general considerations concerning the social and moral evils of slavery, its relation to Republican government, and its inconsistency with the Declaration of Independence and natural right. The second is drawn from the rights of self-government and the nature of political institutions. The third is said to rest on the right of equal citizens of all to go with their property on the public domain. Which approach does Curtis think the court should have followed? Here's more from Jeff. And then listen to what he says here. This is so, such an incredible expression of judicial humility and restraint. He says, basically, which of these views is correct? The court has no concern. The question here is, does the court have the authority to insert itself and to create an exception of the exclusion or allowance of slavery not found in the Constitution? But he's basically saying, when you have these three plausible views, neither of which is um, commanded or uh, excluded by the Constitution, courts should defer to Congress. It's essentially a, a political question in the sense that the ultimate construction of the Constitution here is up to Congress, not to judges. And that extraordinary expression of judicial humility, I suppose, would be the, the core of uh, the, the, the tradition of bipartisan judicial restraint that was resurrected in the 20th century and uses Dred Scott as a warning of the hazards of judicial activism. Turning to Justice McLean's dissent, he took a different approach. Here's Mark. McLean's opinion was much broader. McLean claimed, in fact, that Tawney was almost right. The Constitution did have rules about the territories, but the rules were according to due process. Congress could not allow slavery in the Western territories. So the Missouri Compromise, as applied to Minnesota, was constitutional because even if it didn't exist, Congress could not allow Minnesota territory to have slavery. And he said all free persons born in the United States were citizens of the United States. So once, in fact, Dred Scott became free, he became a citizen. So notice how much broader 
the McLean opinion is, which is why abolitionists far preferred McLean to Curtis, moderates far preferred Curtis to McLean. And here's Earl. Now, it is true that even though Justice McLean would have been in the Republic as a as a Republican, a moderate Republican, that is not Charles Sumner, but uh, he was the most anti-slavery opinion in uh, Prig versus Pennsylvania, the fugitive slave case, for example. Uh, but there, I don't think there's any. I don't think anybody doubts that part of this was a, a sort of campaign speech for McLean. Uh, whatever one thinks about the reasoning of it, McLean was actually running for president at the time. So I think it's on the citizenship issue that it, it is the most forward position, on um, the most progressive position. In its dissent, it's really as much about the language. It reads sort of like a Republican campaign speech. It's on this point that McLean leveled the charge that Tawney's opinion is, quote, more of a matter of taste than of law. He also zeroed in on an aspect where Tawney flat out gets the facts wrong. Here's Jeff. The majority opinion in Dred Scott says uh, we've already said that the right of property in a slave is distinctly and expressly affirmed in the Constitution. Justice McLean refutes that. It's so important to note McLean's refutation. He says, we know as a historical fact that James Madison, that great and good man, a leading member in the federal convention, was solicitous to guard the language of that instrument so as not to convey the idea that there could be property in man. Gosh, it's just so important to to recognize that crucial fact. When Frederick Douglass read Madison's notes, which stated his intention to exclude the idea of property in man, from the Constitution, which were published for the first time in the 1840s, Douglas said it changed his own conception of himself as a man, as a citizen, and convinced him, Frederick Douglass, that he had been wrong to embrace the Garrisonian view that the Constitution was pro-slavery, and in fact, that the Constitution was agnostic on the matter and left the ultimate disposition of slavery to uh, Congress and the states. That historical fact is crucial. The Dred Scott majority is, is playing fast and loose with history and in eliding Madison's care not, to go no further than, than he felt that, that, that he had to. But there was a point beyond which he would not go and he would not affirm in the Constitution the proposition that there could be property in man. And he goes on, oh, it's so great. He says, you know, I, I, I prefer the lights of Madison, Hamilton, and Jay as a mean of construing the Constitution and all its bearings, rather than to look behind that period into a traffic which now declared to be piracy and punished with death by Christian nations. And then on the issue of the Missouri Compromise. He says the fact that Congress and the president really debated whether or not um, there was power to regulate the territories and ultimately decided in favor of the power is relevant. I'm quoting McLean here. He says, an act of James Madison when president forcibly illustrates this policy of of acceptance about the power. Madison had made up his opinion that Congress had no power under the constitution to establish a national bank, but then Madison uh, changed his mind. And he says, let these facts be contrasted with the case before this court. Illinois has declared you can't have slavery. The Supreme Court of that state has agreed with that. And Congress, having repeatedly considered the constitutionality of the Missouri Compromise, as well as presidents of different parties, decided in favor of its constitutionality. So that kind of argument from practice or pragmatism is central to McLean's dissent. Behind the scenes, there was a flurry of activity leading up to the ruling. President-elect James Buchanan got involved. Here's Earl. He uh, uh, pressured Robert Greer, from, who was also from Pennsylvania, to join the majority opinion on this point. So now you have five justices, the five Southern justices, who wish to issue this opinion, holding that as a matter of constitutional law, Congress didn't have the authority to ban slavery in the territories, or I mean, how you look at it, Congress had to allow slavery in the territories. Well, then you have Nelson and Greer, who are would, I suppose would be best described as not anti-slavery Northern Democrats. The idea is you need somebody from the North to be willing to join the five justices from the South to make it at least appear that this is not a purely sectional decision. And so uh, Buchanan pressures Greer and Greer goes on board for that. Curtis and McLean are saying, you don't get it. 
no, that, that you're not going to get people in the North to get on board with this and say, we're just going to move on to this. If the Supreme Court says we've settled this, that what instead you're going to get is an increase in sectional tension. And at his inauguration on March 4th, 1857, just two days before the opinion was released, Buchanan said, Slavery is a question that belongs to the Supreme Court of the United States, before whom it is now pending and will, it is understood, be speedily and finally settled. Buchanan's behind-the-scenes lobbying campaign wasn't the only drama. Benjamin Curtis leaked his dissent to a newspaper in Boston. Here's Earl. So Curtis is obviously upset and disappointed about the way the Tawny and, and the other Southerners decided to write this expansive opinion in uh, Dred Scott. And she just said, so he sends his dissent to a newspaper before Tawny's opinion has been published, as she said, which is sort of a no-no. His explanation, true or not, is that he thought Tawny had actually already made his opinion public. Whether that's true or not is... You could get away with that argument in those days. Yeah, you can get away with that. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, who knows whether it's true or not. So Tawny then re- does what people are doing that do now, which is revise the opinion to take, to, re- to respond to the arguments of the dissent. I mean, that's done all the time now. But he, as you say, he won't show it to Curtis, and Curtis thinks that, that Curtis is very offended by this. This led to an increasingly frosty exchange of letters between the two men throughout the spring and early summer of 1857. Don't take it from us. Here's our colleagues Stephen Anderson and David Dearson performing a dramatic reading of the letters. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the main event, the showdown you've all been waiting for. In one corner, he hails from Calvert County, Maryland, the Doctor of Dread the reigning Chief Justice of the United States, Roger Brooktani! And his opponent across the ring, from Watertown, Massachusetts, the heavyweight champion of Harvard, Benjamin Robbins Curtis! And now, let's get ready to correspond! Here's Justice Curtis. I cannot suppose it was your intention to preclude me from having access to an opinion of the court in the only way possible for me to obtain it. And if it was not, you will confer a favor upon me by directing the clerk to comply with my request. And here's Chief Justice Taney's reply. Dear sir, it is proper that I should explain to you the reasons for giving the order. Soon after the decision was given, circumstances occurred which satisfied the court that justice to itself required that the opinion in this case should be reported and brought before the public under the usual supervision and responsibility of the officer appointed by the court to perform that duty, and that it ought not be separated from all of the other opinions delivered by the court during the term and hurried before the public in an unusual manner by irresponsible reporters through political and partisan newspapers for political and partisan purposes. Later in the letter, Tani explains, It would seem from your letter to me that you suppose you are entitled to demand a copy of the original opinion as a right, being one of the members of the tribunal. This would undoubtedly be the case if you wished it to aid you in the discharge of your official duties. But I understand you as not desiring or intending to use it for that purpose. On the contrary, you announced from the bench that you regarded the opinion as extrajudicial and not binding upon you or anyone else. And if the opinion of the court is desired by the judge, not to aid him in the discharge of his official duties, but for some other unexplained purpose, I do not see that his position in relation to a copy of the opinion differs in respect from that of any other person. I am respectfully, dear sir, your obedient servant, R. B. Tawney. Here's what Justice Curtis had to say next. You appear to have assumed that I desire the paper for some other than an official use. In my judgment, and I cannot doubt you will agree with me, 
A judge who dissents from an opinion of a majority of the court upon questions of constitutional law which deeply affect the country discharges an official duty when he lays before the country the grounds and reasons of his dissent. This opinion of the court was read in conference of all the judges. I shaped my dissent from that opinion accordingly. After I returned home, I was informed that this opinion had been revised and materially altered. I supposed that others would think as I did, that in our country it is impossible to keep from the public what passes in an open court of justice. I have no personal feeling to express other than regret that what I consider my rightful access to the records of the court has been denied me, and, as I fear, under misconstruction of my motives and purposes. With great respect, I am, dear sir, your obedient servant, B. R. Curtis. And back to Chief Justice Taney. I have no desire to continue the unpleasant correspondence which you have been pleased to commence. But there are some passages which cannot be passed by without notice, because my silence in relation to them might lead to erroneous inferences. You speak of the opinion of the court as having been improperly kept back from the public when they had a right to know it. It is true that the opinion was not given to a partisan political journal to be published for partisan and political purposes, but it was delivered in open court in the hearing of everyone who chose to listen. It was placed in the hands of the officer appointed by law to report it as soon as it had undergone the usual revision, and it has been published in the manner which opinions of this court have been published for more than 50 years. But if it is your pleasure to address letters to me, charging me with breaches of official duty, justice to myself, as well as to those members of the court with whom I acted, makes it necessary for me to answer and show the charges to be groundless. And a plain and direct statement of the facts appears to be all that is necessary for that purpose. And having now made it, I have only to add that I am, respectfully, your obedient servant, R.B. Tawney. One last round. Here's the final blow from Justice Curtis. Dear sir, your letter of the 11th instant was received by me this morning. I read it with surprise. I did not suppose I had expressed myself in such a manner as to be open to the misapprehensions your letter shows. It is certain that our correspondence has become unpleasant, but I do not find, by reviewing it, that it began to be so by any act of mine. I had not the least doubt, when I consented to the publication of my own opinion, that the opinion of the court would be at once published in a similar way in the principal newspapers of the country, as it undoubtedly would have done if its publication had not been prevented by a special order. Being conscious of the truth of these facts, I deem them a sufficient reply to that part of your letter, and have only to add that I remain respectfully your obedient servant, B. R. Curtis. And here's Chief Justice Taney's parting shot. Dear Sir, I received your letter of the 16th instant this morning, and I am glad to find that there is nothing in it that requires me to do more than acknowledge its receipt and to say that I am not aware of anything in either of my letters that is not strictly defensive in its character. I am, respectfully, your obedient servant, R.B. Tawney. That fall, Curtis resigned, attributing his departure to his lack of confidence in the court and a lack of willingness among the justices to cooperate. And though he lost at the Supreme Court, Dred Scott's story didn't end there. Just a few months after the court's ruling, Dred, his wife Harriet, and their daughters Eliza and Lizzie got their freedom. Under pressure from her husband, their owner sent the Scots back to their previous owners, who freed them on May 26, 1857. Sadly, Dred Scott only lived another year, dying from tuberculosis in the fall of 1858. But he died a free man. Despite Buchanan's assurances, following the Dred Scott ruling, the matter of slavery was anything but settled. Newspapers across the North castigated it as wicked, abominable, palpable perversions of the views of the Fathers of the Republic, and denounced the cunning chief, whose shallow sophistry showed a detestable hypocrisy and a mean and skulking cowardice. 
One paper condemned it as, quote, a vain attempt to change the law by the power of judges who have achieved only their own infamy and warned, if people obey this decision, they disobey God. And what came next? The rise of Abraham Lincoln, constitutional crisis, secession, civil war, emancipation, and ultimately, reconstruction. Never before had a Supreme Court ruling provoked such heated controversy. But in the end, was it a catalyst for the Civil War? Here's Jeff. I think that the the more, I don't know whether it's a revisionist or considered narrative among historians now, is that the war was caused by a series of factors that followed the infamous events of, of 1850 and bleeding Kansas and, and, and the weakness of political leaders, including President uh, Buchanan, allowed secession to take place. So it was not the, it was not the, the, the Dred Scott decision that, that caused the Civil War. But the Dred Scott decision did, which makes it the, the most infamous Supreme Court decision in history, is it, is it squarely embraced a hotly contested and ultimately unpersuasive uh, vision of the Constitution uh, that arguably a majority of the country did not embrace. It was only the radical minority of the most pro-slavery s- Southern slavercrats who held that Congress had absolutely no power to ban slavery in the federal uh, territories. Uh, there were more moderate positions, both uh, abolitionists to eliminate uh, slavery or thought it was already unconstitutional according to natural law, and the Douglas Democrats who who, who would have allowed each state or territory to decide for themselves. But but Tawney had a had, had skin in the game because he had, as Jackson's attorney general, embraced this extremely pinched vision of Congress's power under the territories clause. He was determined to write it into law. He falsely believed that by embracing the constitutional vision of the Southern slavocrats, he could avert uh, war and 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 solve the contested question. And that act of judicial hubris, which wrongly believed that judges by embracing contested views can uh, end constitutional conflict, proved to be fatally misjudged. In that sense, the Dred Scott ruling is a cautionary tale for judges. By saying the Constitution forbade Congress from regulating slavery, the majority exceeded its own constitutional authority. Our ideals eventually won out with the passage of the 13th and 14th Amendments, which banned slavery and made clear that anyone born in the United States is a citizen. But I'm left wondering about the founders and the original Constitution. How should we think about them today? Here's what Jeff had to say. It's possible for people like Jefferson to be notorious racists. And in fact, Jefferson's racism, uh, the more we learn about him, was really appalling. But yet at the same time, he wrote the immortal language of the Declaration, which although he didn't create, um, created and it gave voice to in immortal and inspiring language, the ideals that have united America and provided the foundation for the ultimate abolition of slavery and the enfranchisement of previously excluded groups throughout American history. So, so people are complicated. There's not always a complete connection between their constitutional and their political views. And we've got to read the primary sources in order to really have a sense of things. It's too easy to put people in categories and assume from snippets that we understand the full picture. I didn't have a sense until I read Dred Scott from beginning to end exactly how thoroughly Tawney's arguments were um, abolished by the dissents. And speaking of old Roger Tawney, as it turns out, his own views, at least for a time, were a little more nuanced than you might expect from someone who wrote that black people had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. We asked Tim Hubner, you may remember from our episode on the Charles River Bridge case, about this. This is a fascinating story. It's uh, a Methodist minister named Jacob Gruber who preaches an anti-slavery sermon in Maryland. There's an audience of slaveholders there. They're not happy with Gruber's sermon. He's arrested, charged with um, disturbing the peace. And actually, there were some African-Americans who were, who were also present when the sermon was actually preached. And Roger Tawney defends Jacob Gruber, the anti-slavery minister. This is in 1819. So this is 
almost 40 years before Dred Scott versus Sanford. And Taney, in the course of his argument, says, quote, yeah, slavery is a blot on our national character. And he basically goes on to say that everyone ought to you know, do all that we can to abolish it. So Tawney is moderately anti-slavery. He frees almost all of his own slaves. He votes in the Maryland Senate uh, while he's serving in the Maryland Senate in such a way that one could interpret as, um, again, moderately anti-slavery. And then he makes this statement in 1819. And if you and if you take all of that, uh, you know, all of that, and you add it all up, and this is in the 18 teens into the 1820s, one can draw a sort of portrait of Fawney as this moderately anti-slavery Marylander who's doing all that he can to keep free blacks from being sort of kidnapped and put into slavery. And so you sort of take that vision of uh, Tawney and then you and then you take the Tawney that we all know from the 1850s and we think how does this fit? But that starting in the early 1830s Tawney's views really started to shift dramatically. And what brought about this shift? And part of that is Tawney is very much a sort of creature of the National Democratic Party and the Democratic Party especially by the end of the 1840s and into the 1850s, is very pro-slavery, and not just pro-slavery, but pro-extension of slavery into the West. And the politics of, of slavery in the South, in Maryland, in the entire, in the entire nation, uh, affect Tawney. And part of this is that Tawney is forced to choose sides when some of the more abolitionist elements of the anti-slavery movement, and Tawney was never an abolitionist, understanding that there are shades of anti-slavery in the early 19th century, he was on the moderate end. He said slavery ought to gradually be ended. And so Tawney is forced to sort of take sides. You know, when an abolitionist in Maryland, a fellow by the name of Benjamin Lundy, is involved in sort of activism and sort of protest there, that stirs up the population of uh, Baltimore. And I think it's that moment in the late 1830s where we cease to see any evidence at all after that, that Tawney is sympathetic to the plight of, uh, of either free African-Americans or those who were held in slavery. And then, of course, by the time we get to uh, Dred Scott, we see Tawney at the pinnacle of his kind of pro-slavery thought where he says that African-Americans have no rights. So, I mean, it's a very interesting shift. I mean, you know, I don't think I ever fully answered that question to my own satisfaction, but I do think that the national context of the Democratic Party and the local context in Baltimore and in Maryland really have an effect on Tony's views. What should we make of all this? We shouldn't erase our history, even the bad stuff. As the descendants of Dred Scott and Roger Tawney said when they met for a reconciliation in 2017, Americans should learn from their history, not bury their history. Special thanks to our guests, and be sure to check out the National Constitution Center's We the People podcast, a weekly show of constitutional debate hosted by Jeffrey Rosen that shares the best arguments on all sides of issues at the center of American life. Thanks for listening to DIST. Please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd appreciate your feedback, so send questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes to dist at pacificlegal.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and tell your friends to check out DIST. Should and I you have a great it? article about Justice Benjamin Curtis. Well, I thought it was a great article. <laughs> <sighs> okay, that was a Hamilton reference. There's a song, and it's the angry letters between Hamilton and Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr. I'm like, what's his name? Um, <laughs> where they're, yeah, they're like singing their angry correspondence. So that's what is inspiring the 
Curtis Tawney back and forth. Okay. Um, but let's A jump in. Dot bo. E dot slap. People are complicated. Justices are complicated. complicated. Not me. I'm simple. I have to thank you for this homework assignment. And I'm just abashed uh, that in my long years studying and teaching constitutional law, I never actually read the original decision. This is a lot of a lot of letter. It's so good, though. Your obedient servant. B. R. B. Tony. B. R. Dot Kurt. R. B. Dot Tony. Never gets old. I'm leaving. See, leave, <laughs> leave. It won't. It won't. It won't let me. So I. I had another question that just came to me, but it slipped my mind. <laughs> yeah, as academic, we, we, I can go on <laughs> forever. What about the majority exceeded its own constitutional authority? Do you mm, like that? Love it. That's even better. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I like when we enjoy our own stuff so much that we're like, mm, <laughs> that's good. Uh, okay. Sorry. Is it hot in there? It's 2.41, so you know it's like, I'm like baking in this office right now. Don't you guys have AC? Or- <laughs> Apparently not. Not, I don't know. <laughs> Everyone's like a- offices get really hot. Okay, sorry. I guess they're all glass or like little like greenhouses. Um, <clears throat> if I start sprouting flowers, you'll know why. <laughs> <laughs>